Thanks to everyone for coming. My name is Karen Gregor and with Microsoft a lot. Beside me, there is my colleague Karen Donovan. We did have a smile when we saw the, the sign. We said, ask the experts Microsoft. Um, we're really pleased to have real experts here today. Um, we have Hugh Lindley from Avalara. And uh, where's, where's Nathan go? Where's Nathan hiding? Where's Nathan? Okay, I'm Nathan. over here. Oh, oh, there you are. Thank you. I Took off your jacket. And okay, so Nathan Lucerno is also from Avalara. There are some great partners that work with us in the area of identity and access management. And if there was ever a place where you want to have experts involved, I'd say that would be the place. So I'll happily feed the floor to Q to talk about identity and access. However, if there's other questions as we go along, which requires a different uh, input from us, I'm happy. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Karen. Really appreciate it, and uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be here and you know talk to all of all of the uh, IT leaders from uh, from higher education for sure. I know that uh, I know that each of you are dealing with uh, probably some pretty huge identity challenges right now, um, and hopefully uh, most of them will come up in in today's session. Uh, and if they don't. Uh, please don't hesitate to, uh, uh, to ask a question. Um, so Nathan and I are from a company called Avalaris. Uh, we're a Microsoft Gold partner uh, for identity and access. Essentially all we do is identity and access work. Uh, we do about 80% of uh, the identity work for Microsoft in Canada. Uh, we do actually work uh, down in the States as well. Um, and we do still have clients over in Europe. Uh, our previous company uh, was called Alacris. Uh, it sold a product called ID Nexus. Um, and Alacris got very well known around the world for doing uh, smart card and certificate management systems. And about six years ago, Microsoft came along and, and bought that company uh, and actually integrated it into uh, Forefront Identity Manager, which is uh, one of the products that I'll, uh, I'll be talking about today. So. We saw a, a, a huge opportunity at that point to, uh, uh, to help Microsoft uh, uh, you know, spread the word uh, uh, in its own uh, identity uh, capabilities. Um, and it's been a, been a real interesting run for us uh, uh, so far. Certainly been doing uh, quite a bit of work in, uh, in the higher ed space uh, and, uh, and the secondary level as well. Um, but it's all really around uh, identity uh, and access management. So when I look at uh, identity in general, um, I'm really looking at uh, a set of processes uh, and technologies that allow you to effectively uh, and consistently manage uh, access and identity uh, to multiple systems, right? Sounds easy. Uh, as you all know, in, in real life, this, this can be a, a huge headache uh, and a great amount of grief. Um, so that's really what uh, uh, what keeps companies uh, like ours in, in business is, is helping you with that, that grief. We've seen a, a lot of different um, identity management challenges in, in higher ed. And I don't think I'm going to be telling you anything that you don't know already because you're probably dealing with all of these problems right now. Um, the reason that I bring them up is that uh, I see these challenges as being fairly unique to higher ed. Um, and when you're looking at, a, uh, at an identity management system, uh, you've actually got to take these factors into account because you know, if you don't, you're going to have to deal with them very, very quickly. Um, the whole idea of semester-based provisioning, right? You have uh, uh, a lot of students showing up uh, you know, at the beginning of the year. You need to provision them out to systems. Uh, you need to give them access to learning management systems. You need to uh, perhaps give them access to email. Um, this all has to be done very, very quickly, very sh short amount of time, so that they can, uh, uh, you know, start their uh, their educational journey, uh, whatever that may be. You've got uh, very interesting um, uh, higher ed applications, right? That you don't really have anywhere else. You've got student information systems um, that are uh, quite unique from from what I've seen. Uh, you may have campus portals. Uh, I know a lot of you are uh, uh, are using cloud applications now. Um, you know whether it be uh, uh, Google, Google, whether it be uh, Office 365 or the previous incarnation Live.edu. Uh, so that's often part of your environment. Um, of course, the campus environment is a bring-your-own-device environment. 
Um, you can't say no to those professors, no matter how much you want to, uh, or to the students. Um, so you end up running your network as it, as it was uh, uh, an internet, uh, for example. Um, another thing that I think that's rather unique to, uh, to higher ed is, is just all of the different roles uh, and relationships that those roles have. Uh, and this is quite different from role management in a, in a traditional enterprise, right? Traditional enterprise may have 100, 150 roles. Um, in higher ed, you might be limited to 20, 25 uh, in order th to make things manageable for your 80,000 plus users that, uh, uh, that you're trying to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I guess the other thing that's kind of unique uh, about identity for higher ed is, is alumni, right? You want to keep these guys and gals on the hook uh, to pay you money uh, down the road where you, when you're asking for you know, endowments for, for big buildings and, and whatnot on campus. I know this because Carlton calls me up every week and ask me for, for cash. Um, but this is, this is kind of interesting from an identity perspective because it's a user who has essentially left your organization who you really, really want to keep in touch with because there's a, uh, a revenue driver there. Um, so I think all of these things are, are unique about higher ed. Um, I've got some strategies for, for dealing with that. Um, and uh, towards the end of my presentation, um, you know, I'll be giving you a, a reference architecture that I, I tend to use with some of my educational clients. So the, I think there, there are other uh, more tactical uh, challenges that we run into from an identity perspective in, in higher ed as well. There's kind of the traditional of, you know, how do you very quickly um, provision uh, access to applications for your users? Um, how do you um, you know, make sure that uh, uh, you're keeping track of uh, all of the identity information across your campus, right? I know that a lot of your campuses are federated and, um, you know, you have faculties that essentially run their own IT departments in some cases and, you know, maybe they run their own mail system still, which is kind of a big uh, source of identity information. Um, but really, um, you know, if you want to start taking control of this, you've got to start tracking that information, bringing it into uh, you know, one spot, perhaps a meta directory, uh, perhaps an LDAP server, perhaps it's Active Directory, um, perhaps it's all three of those things to go from 20 directories down to three, um, but uh, uh, it is a, a unique identity challenge that, uh, that you face and you need some tools to, uh, uh, to deal with this. This uh, horrendous diagram is uh, uh, Microsoft stack of, of products and the, the key point that I'm trying to make with this is you know Active Directory really is key to, to solving this problem. Uh, Microsoft does have identity products, really good identity products that can help you uh, with these challenges. So that's primarily uh, Forefront Identity Manager, uh, but it could be uh, Active Directory Federation Services, it could be uh, Office 365, could be a combination of, uh, uh, of all of these things. So what I want to do is take a, a few minutes to talk about uh, a Forefront Identity Manager, which we have used with, with a number of, uh, uh, a number of uh, higher ed clients. Really sort of four main pillars uh, to this product. Um, the idea is that you put as much power in the hands of uh, your users, so your faculty and your students, uh, so you can reduce uh, the calls to your help desk, re reduce the impact on, on your own uh, IT staff, right? So the more, the more capability that you can give them, the better. Um, similarly, the more efficiency that you can get, more efficiency you can yield in terms of uh, provisioning or deprovisioning users, uh, the better as well. Um, I know that, uh, uh, how do I say this? that IT security is kind of a tenuous uh, topic in, in higher ed today. I think everybody knows they need more of it. Uh, they're having a hard time achieving it because a lot of the industry standards out there, uh, quite frankly, aren't all, uh, ha haven't really thought through what's actually required from a higher ed perspective, which is a much more open and less controlled environment than, uh, than a typical enterprise. So FIM has some, some capabilities to deal uh, with that. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, uh, uh, the need to be agile from a business perspective. 
um, you know, you, you, you will often, I'm sure you've often had, uh, uh, you know, deans uh, come in and ask you why you're not using the latest and greatest technology and you're not totally taking advantage of cloud to run your infrastructure, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, FIM is, is really designed to, to meet all of, all of these needs and can be a significant assistance in a, uh, uh, you know, in a higher ed uh, environment. I don't know how many clients I've had who have justified the implementation of identity management solely on the basis of self-service password reset. And so this idea of just giving your users the ability to reset their own passwords without calling a help desk, you can cost justify the implementation of one of these systems on that function uh, alone. Um, this is not to say that there are other user functions that uh, uh, that can't also be implemented at the same time uh, and achieve the same thing. You know, wouldn't it be great if you can give some, you know, esoteric professor of postmodern Italian literature, you know, the ability to update their own distribution list, right? If they could add uh, and delete users from that list, then, you know, perhaps they wouldn't be bugging your, uh, uh, your help desk to do them for it, uh, do it for them. Similarly, uh, you know, giving users the ability to update their own information, right? Um, you know, all students have cell phones today. Probably it's, uh, uh, you know, SMS texting is probably second only to Facebook updates in the way that they actually communicate with people. And if you can give them the ability to, you know, update their own cell phone information, have that automatically uh, populated back into your uh, campus directory, you know, maybe you do actually have a hope of uh, implementing a campus-wide emergency management system that, that sends an SMS message out to those users. So, you know, giving um, users that self-service capability is, is, is huge and, and probably one of the top reasons I, I see identity management systems being adopted. Um, there are some huge, huge operational efficiencies when you start uh, doing automated uh, provisioning and deprovisioning. Uh, from FIM, we, from a FIM perspective, we call this synchronization. But essentially, what it is is, you know, pulling users in from a particular authoritative source, like a student information system or a human resources system, and uh, applying business rules to that so that they're automatically populated into into the groups that they need access to, right? Um, so that all of that baseline information is is there for them, and that you know, if there are other systems that actually require approvals. Um, by business owners, perhaps it's uh, access to a finance system, uh, for example, you can, you know, integrate that uh, into the process as well. So there's huge potential operational efficiencies. Uh, as I mentioned before... Excuse the interruption. Uh, we have a special guest who just would like to come say hi to all the guests. Just going to bring him in for a second. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, hello. Wonderful to be in Ottawa. You know, you guys look like you're busy studying something. Uh, <laughs> I used to study lots of things, <laughs> women, cars. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I yeah, just uh, you know, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just want to say hi and everything. And uh, you know, is there uh, any questions anybody has? No. Okay, great. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, uh, I like my shift to Burger King, so I uh, said, so, uh, my goodness, we're good time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, take care. Thank you very much. Now, that is obviously a gentleman that does not have an identity crisis. <laughs> 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 no, it's it's not not <laughs> wow, that was unexpected. <laughs> For sure, for sure. <laughs> so uh, obviously security was, I'm not sure if it was working or not working, or still working. <laughs> but from an identity perspective, uh, there's a huge amount of stuff you can do to actually improve your overall uh, security posture, right? And it can do it, um, I'm not going to say automagically, but uh, by the sheer fact that you're tracking where users are being provisioned to uh, and you're taking away their access on a timely basis, you know, perhaps when the semester ends, you revoke access for all of the students uh, for whatever they need to be revoked from. You know, the fact that you're doing that uh, automatically uh, and tracking that uh, is going to increase your security posture. 
um, almost automatically. Um, the fact that you can actually generate a report that says, you know, all of these users have access to this particular system, and can you you can walk that report into your director of finance uh, in your administrative faculty uh, in your administrative branch. Um, you know, means that they can actually sign off on it and uh, and really do attestation for once. Um, so there's there's a lot of subtle ways that you can improve overall uh, uh, your overall security. Um, certainly, uh, with uh, this version of FIM, uh, it adds in a capability for role-based access control. And to be honest with you, it's it's been there for years. Uh, it's just a lot easier to use now. Um, so if you're trying to, you know, uh, define classes of users, whether it's students, faculty, uh, you know, support staff, sessional lecturers, uh, whatever it may be, um, you can uh, define that within the product and make sure that, uh, you know, that those roles are only provisioned to the systems that they're supposed to have access to and that, you know, when the sessional lecturer's term ends, they are uh, revoked access. Uh, something else that uh, that we're seeing a lot of that, that quite frankly I think education is a complete leader in this area, um, but uh, enterprise organizations are are not as much. So I'm probably not going to tell you that uh, this is not going to surprise you very much. But you know a lot of the times we when you're dealing with what I call the asymmetric identity challenge, which is a very very high number of users uh, with uh, uh, you know say 80,000 users, and maybe you've got uh, only you know 4,000 uh, actual staff uh, on board dealing with that. Um, that's an asymmetric identity challenge, right? Especially if you're doing online service delivery to these users, whether it's giving them access to their own uh, student portal to pick up their marks, um, or you know whether it's giving them access to a cloud application uh, or you know some other online service delivery uh, system that you have, whether it's campus uh, Wi-Fi. You know, FIM can be used to uh, to do uh, group management and access control for all of those types of uh, systems by using other Microsoft products like Active Directory Federation Services, which is absolutely free, by the way, if you, if you already own uh, uh, Windows Server, which uh, I'd hazard to guess most people in the room do. Um, you know, you can actually use it to federate to cloud apps uh, and control access uh, to systems that are outside of your environment as well. Okay, so enough with uh, uh, kind of the regular marketing slides. Um, and I can't go past this line or else oh, this is going to come back. <laughs> what I've got here is, is a reference architecture uh, that I'll often use with, with my educational clients just to talk them through uh, the different capabilities. Um, and I can't honestly say that I've implemented this whole architecture for, for one, you know, for all my clients. But I've definitely uh, have implemented different aspects of this uh, for different clients. Um, what you see on the left-hand side is really kind of that authoritative source for identity information. You may have a student, well, you do probably have a student information system. You may also have a, an HR system uh, as well. It's pumping identity into uh, Forefront Identity Manager. Um, it in turn is actually pushing those accounts out to uh, the other systems uh, that need uh, need that identity information. Whether it's a learning management system, some sort of portal, maybe you have a campus card that uh, that you're issuing. At the same time, it's it's pushing that identity information down to Active Directory, um, which in turn is is making it available um, to other systems that are Active Directory based. So in this particular environment, you can see that. You know, not only are we doing uh, provisioning on campus, uh, but we're also, you know, using Active Directory Federation services uh, to create a federated trust uh, with Office 365, uh, so that, you know, through simple group membership uh, on campus, you'll be able to, uh, you know, dictate whether a user, whether a student has access to the student email system uh, or not. Um, we're also leveraging some, some other capabilities here as well. There may be uh, systems that you have on campus that, um, uh, that are SAML based and can take advantage of, of federation. Um, and you know, even if the system is not directly AD integrated, uh, you can achieve single sign-on uh, through using this sort of federation technology 
uh, with your own web applications, right? It's a very powerful way to, um, you know, make an identity management system uh, useful to your to your students, right, and, and to your faculty. I think you'll find that, you know, once they start realizing that, you know, hey, I can get by with, um, you know, a single username and password to access my email, to access my LMS, to access, uh, you know, my uh, whatever the teacher equivalent of the student information system is, um, you know, they can, uh, uh, they'll start seeing, you know, some huge, huge benefits from this. So the, the other aspect of this uh, that uh, I'll share, there's a portal uh, that provides a management interface into FIM. I'm actually gonna be doing uh, most of my demonstration based on that today. Uh, so you'll see how, uh, how an administrator would interact with this system. Uh, users, it's kind of funny where I put the uh, the users in this whole scenario, but you know I know that most of you now essentially treat your campus networks like they are the internet, right? Um, and I think that's a really good way to uh, sort of think about this reference architecture. You know, especially if students are using kind of God knows what device, right? Whether it's an iPad, whether it's uh, a MacBook, whether it's a Windows 8 tablet, whether it's um, you know, some phone of unknown origin that has a web browser on it. Um, and, you know, professors and faculty essentially doing the same, uh, you almost have to treat them like, like they're coming from the internet. And the only thing that you really can grasp onto in that case is their identity, right? You can't control their device. You can't control their, their connectivity method. But what you do have a foothold onto is their username uh, and their password to access the systems that you want them to have access to. Um, so I think it's a really good kind of way to just conceptualize, uh, conceptualize this. So uh, I will move along. I can certainly answer some questions on this uh, later if, if there are any. Uh, I'm sure it was uh, completely self-explanatory. <laughs> um, in my demonstration, uh, I've actually custom designed a student information system for you. Mm -hmm. It's, as you'll see, it's very, very complex. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you sort of what the authoritative source that, uh, that, that I'm dealing with. Um, I'm going to show you a customized interface uh, that we put together for, for higher education. It's nothing... Uh, 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 elaborate, but uh, you can see how FIM can be molded uh, to, to different requirements through this customization. I'm going to give you a view into the uh, identity information and identity attributes that are uh, tracked for students uh, and, uh, uh, and staff. I'm going to show you the capability for, uh, uh, you know, for that, uh, uh, you know, for a, a faculty member to go in and actually update their own uh, email distribution list. Uh, and then I'm going to sort of finalize things by uh, showing you uh, uh, student uh, self-service from a, a password reset perspective. So take you through a registration uh, and, uh, uh, and a password reset. Hey, there was a question. Yeah, it was back to um, all the architecture of sharing. Um, you know, there's, there's often a quest to kind of unify things and have a single user and password. As I look at you know data classification and security architecture and things like that, it might actually make more sense to to have kind of higher security environments. So I'm wondering how how does the solution fit if I was to let's say have a multi-domain architecture where one domain might be making use of um, this is theoretical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one domain might be using two-factor authentication with some other you know, some partner solution. Yep. And one isn't, you know, and uh, and how would the, you know, how would this, would, I mean, does this lend itself well to, to a more complex environment? It, it sure does. So, you know, I'll start off by saying that the, these products from Microsoft um, uh, have a long heritage. Um, I was just going to complain about Microsoft not promoting them all that well, but uh, but that's not quite true. Uh, the uh, the product names have changed a little bit over the years, right? The, the actual core synchronization engine is based uh, on uh, technology that's evolved over a 10-year 10 10 year period. 
So it's quite complex in terms of what it can do. Uh, and it's not just designed to connect into SQL uh, and Active Directory. We can talk to an open LDAP directory. We can talk to Sun LDAP. We can talk to Novell. Uh, we can deal with uh, a multi-directory environment. And in fact, uh, we can deal with situations where there's multiple uh, authoritative sources. We can deal with multiple forests uh, as well. So there's no reason why uh, this thin synchronization server can't connect into two, three, four, ten uh, different forests. I was working with a client in BC, uh, Health Shared Services BC, and one of their challenges was going from six different uh, AD forests down to a single forest. And they're actually using thin to deal with this because you, you don't do that overnight in a, in a user, uh, user uh, community of 250,000 users, right? You've got to do it kind of over time. And FIM was kind of the core, core mechanism to do that. Uh, in terms of the multi-security, multi-classification uh, uh, multi level, um, you know, technologies like AD uh, and ADFS will deal with multiple uh, multiple form factors for, for authentication. So you can authenticate to AD using a smart card. Uh, you can authenticate to ADFS using a smart card. You can even do step up authentication uh, with Active Directory and, and, uh, and Active Directory Federation services, where if you're accessing a particular resource, it can prompt you for, for an additional level of authentication. Um, the, the other point that you're making around single sign-on is kind of interesting because it's always been my uh, my own pet peeve with it is that as you consolidate access under a single credential, um, it almost necessitates the increase of assurance in, in the credential uh, form factor, right? In terms of the actual authentication that you're performing, right? More systems you give access to, and if somebody still has a lousy password, you know, you, you've just increased your exposure. Well, you know, what can you do? You can enforce strong passwords like you should be doing. Uh, and you can start going down the route of uh, adding uh, multiple authentication form factors. That is a huge headache within, um, within uh, the higher ed space, right? Uh, because the, the enrollment of smart cards, the issuance of smart cards, the issuance of multiple form factors for authentication can be a real pain in the rump. Uh, with the exception that almost every student on campus today, remember my Facebook cell phone comment, has the ability to re receive a, a text message. Um, and with FIM, you can actually exploit that capability. So I'm not gonna demonstrate it today, but uh, you can actually do a password self-service reset uh, if you know the student's uh, tele mobile phone number, you can text them a one-time uh, password that they can use to reset, uh, reset their password. So no shared secrets, you know, just give me uh, you're uh, just when you're doing the enrollment. Make sure you're capturing the uh, the cell phone number. So it's not a bad way to do it. It's not a bad way to do it. They might see some utility in it. Um, I guess there is the challenge that they kind of change once in a while, but uh, um, but it's better than nothing. Um, Microsoft acquired a company uh, just over the last year called Phone Factor, and I think they've renamed the. The, they've rebranded it uh, Active Authentication, something close to that. Um, so you're, you're going to start seeing that more and more, um, both in terms of integration with, with products like FIM, but also integration with Microsoft's online services uh, and Office 365 as, a, you know, as another uh, authentication form factor. So does that answer your question? Yep. Yeah. Yes roundabout, elaborate kind of way. Um, so this is the demo that I want to do. I've got uh, a few minutes to do it. So I'm just going to get into my demo environment here. Now, I'm running this um, off of, uh, uh, of Microsoft Hyper-V. Um, and I've got both a server and a client configured. Uh, my server is running on uh, Windows Server 2008. And uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm surprised it's actually running. It's, um, uh, it's running on SQL Server. I've got Active Directory. It's an Active Directory domain uh, server. And I've got the FIM server on here as well. And what you see on the screen is, is actually the primary uh, management interface. And I'm, I'm logged in as a, 
uh, equivalent of a root user, right? God user, I can do anything that I want uh, on this system. Uh, so I've got all, all functionality. Um, you'll notice that there's some slight customizations uh, that, uh, that have been done. I uh, couldn't quite get the product team to put the Avalaris logo in, so I decided to do it myself. Um, and I've also uh, added some capabilities down the left-hand side here that, that don't typically show up in a, in a real uh, deployment. So you can see here that I can, uh, I can go in and I can see uh, a list of courses. Um, that are actually uh, mirroring uh, groups, Active Directory groups that I've got set up. Uh, I can go in and take a look at different classes of, of users. Uh, so I have uh, staff uh, that are configured in the system, and I'm sure these professors would love to know that I'm referring to them as staff versus faculty, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, I've got uh, all of my students, and in fact, I've got some graduate students in here uh, as well. Uh, so, you know, users that aren't really users anymore, um, alumni perhaps. Uh, I've also got uh, distribution groups uh, set up in the system, um, so a few number of distribution groups. Uh, and what else do I have here? Uh, all of my security groups. So uh, I have some security groups that I've specifically set up for, for this demo. I'm going to drill into... Um, some uh, a feature that I think is really neat uh, for uh, for Finn, and what this capability is, is, it's called profile management. But you know, to think of it, if, if you think about it from a technical perspective, um, it's really the ability to see all of the attributes that are tracked on a on a particular user. Uh, and for those of you that have spent any time with Active Directory, you'll notice that some of these fields actually map to uh, Active Directory fields, not all of them. So for this particular user, um, you know, she's the Dean of Political Science, belongs to the Faculty of Arts. You know, she's got her mobile phone number in there. Um, I put a little customization into this profile uh, for something that I call entitlements. And this is, this is kind of a, a quick and dirty way of, of showing you how, um, you know, group management and, and provisioning could work uh, on, this, uh, on this system. So I've essentially checked off the systems that that she has access to, um, you know, because she is faculty, uh, we're not giving her an Office 365 account. We're doing an on-premise uh, exchange account. Uh, but yeah, she's got access to the campus Wi-Fi network. Uh, she's got a campus card issued. Uh, she, even though she's the dean, um, she uh, still has some classes that uh, that she teaches. Uh, so she's got access to Blackboard as well. Uh, and of course, she's got Unix uh, user access because she does. Uh, uh, statistical uh, reports uh, using uh, the uh, campus Unix system. Well, that's quite interesting. I can track uh, similar information uh, on the students. And you'll notice here that there is no work information for the student, uh, just contact information, uh, though they do have entitlements. Uh, as well. If I wanted to rapidly uh, provision them to um, Office 365, I could simply, you know, click this list and uh, uh, upon the next synchronization, uh, it would write that out to, uh, uh, to Active Directory. Now, something I can do quite quickly here is just show you some basic approval uh, capabilities within the system. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, it'd be great if we could give that faculty member the ability to update their own uh, distribution list and manage it, uh, manage it themselves. Um, you can see that this particular group that's been set up, it's manually uh, based membership, manual based membership. Got a few members in there already. Um, so I'm going to, uh, and keep in mind I'm in here as the, as the root uh, administrator. So I'm going to add some additional uh, users into this. So I'm being queried from Active Directory. I'm going to submit it. I'm going to submit it to the system. And I um, uh, should get a message here essentially saying pending approval. Well, that's that's interesting. Why is that? I'm, I'm the God administrator, and I should darn well be able to do this whenever I want to. 
Uh, well, it's actually pending approval uh, by the owner of the group. So that's great. Let's, let's actually go in and, and see who the owner of that group is. So we've got Anne, is, uh, Anne Provencher is, uh, is the administrator of this group. So let's go in now and take a look at that from her perspective. So I've, I've now logged into a, a Windows 7 client. Um, I have logged back into the, uh, the FIM interface and I've now got the u essentially the user interface into FIM uh, that allows me to do uh, quite a bit. Now you, you typically wouldn't give a user all of this capability. Um, you can see that it's kind of reduced from the administrator, uh, but in this case, um, it just serves the purpose uh, for my demos. Um, so I'm going to go in and I'm going to take a look at uh, any requests that have gone through the system. So these are the things that I have to go in and, and approve or, or disapprove. So I can uh, take a look at any changes that have been made. So it looks like I need to add these three users uh, into this group, which is fine. So I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, and approve that. Now, while that's going on, I'm, I'm really just showing you one interface uh, that can be used uh, to do this. There's a full integration with Outlook. And uh, as you can see, um, you know, a notification has come back to that user uh, through their Outlook account saying that this change has been made. Right? So this is, this is really good, especially if you've got a, you know, a business owner who uh, is delegating uh, administrative privileges to somebody else if they want to stay in the loop to see who's been added to this distribution list. This could just as easily be a, uh, a security group within Active Directory uh, as well. So this whole approval process can, uh, can work uh, in this regard. Users can also um, use Outlook to request membership uh, in groups uh, and have that uh, uh, workflow to the, to the proper owner uh, and have approvals done there too. So all of this capability is enabled within Outlook. You can do it through a web browser as well, um, but uh, it really gives you some, some latitude in terms of how, how users can, uh, can get access to the system, uh, especially if you're, as I say, uh, delegating out some of those uh, uh, administrative functions. So one other thing that uh, I'll show you before I flip back to uh, the user is how I'm going about uh, defining some of these groups. You'll notice here that, uh, uh, that I've got a number of groups that match up to some of the profile uh, entitlements that, uh, that I'd configured. And essentially these are dynamic groups uh, that are being populated on the basis of, uh, uh, of whether that particular bit is, uh, is turned on or not. So let's take a look at, at Blackboard, the, the checkbox that would be in uh, the user profile. So you can see here, this is a group that I've set up for, for Blackboard membership. Uh, it's a criteria-based group. And the criteria is simply looking at this particular attribute and uh, you know, validating it, validating whether it's true or not. I can do this for any attribute that is tracked uh, for a particular user. I've obviously gone in and, and added this particular attribute into the system, um, but uh, to you know, so that I can use it through the profile management. Um, but uh, I can control access to this particular group uh, on the basis of of that bit uh, being turned on or, or not. I can add some, you know, more comprehensive rules here. I can do things like, uh, uh, you know, do it based on the faculty or department that the user belongs to. Um, you know, essentially any information that's being tracked uh, can be, uh, uh, you know, can be uh, uh, formulated into a uh, into a, uh, into a rule. So the last thing that I want to, uh, to finish off with here is I just want to show you how easy it is for a user to register for password self-service um, and reset their password. So I'll just log in as a different user. Okay. 
And I'll start by actually knowing my password. Oh, maybe I won't. It's always hard to type standing up. That's, that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. So the first thing that I've got to do is, uh, is actually register for password reset, right? The way that FIM does this, uh, as I mentioned, you can do it through, through uh, an SMS message um, uh, and taking the user's mobile phone. Uh, more often, um, we are also using uh, shared secrets, uh, which requires a registration process. So I'm just going to go through that process now. Yes. Um, so yes and no. So if it's a domain connected machine, I can flip some switches and I can have some nagware that forces this browser to come up and uh, forces them to go through registration, right? So that's great for, for staff, that's great for faculty, that's great for domain connected people. Um, for students uh, who, uh, who quite frankly couldn't give a hoot about that, uh, you, you have to do something a little bit more onerous. Um, so you might have to send them an email that tells them if they want to be able to do uh, you know, password self-service, they've got to hit this site, they've got to provide their, uh, their shared secrets. Or you end up using uh, shared secrets that they perhaps provide when they've actually registered uh, with the university. So, or college. What is my last name? Hmm, not sure. Uh, a very sophisticated uh, student number, and uh, I'm going to disclose some highly confidential information. So that would be an example of stuff that they previously provided that they didn't have to be registered. That's right. That's right. So I'm I'm now registered, and keep in mind I've done this completely through a web interface here. This is just a browser, and just because I'm demonstrating it in in Internet Explorer, and I was too lazy to install Chrome and Firefox and uh, confuse you by flipping through all three of them, uh, it will in fact this interface will run on those browsers as well. Because again, you can't really control that. Now I'm going to. Um, I'm going to log off here and I'm going to promptly forget my password. Now, the way that I'm going to demonstrate resetting my password uh, is in fact through uh, a Windows credential provider. Now, again, you could completely do this through a web interface as well. Um, it just Kind of serves the purposes of, of my demonstration to, to do this. So let's say I you know go off um, tree planting uh, you know in BC for the summer, come back and uh, I've spent way too much time out in the woods doing what I won't tell you, uh, and I've totally forgot my password. So I'm going to go through that password self service reset, and it's going to prompt me for that information. This is a memory test. And of course, it's now going to ask me to reset my password. And if I can type it in the same way twice. And by the way, this adheres to your Active Directory uh, security policy or passwords. If it doesn't, if you type something in that's invalid, you will get prompted at this point. And of course, I can, so I'm back at the login screen. Yep. So for, for domain joined machines, yes. Um, it, actually, even for non-domain joined machines, you can use a web-based portal. Um, so I've got the equivalent uh, of a web-based portal that doesn't require any sort of FIM client to be distributed whatsoever. Um, there are some there are some benefits to using uh, the FIM client in the sense that you can uh, flip some bits and force users to register. Uh, which again is is worthwhile for for domain connected users, um, but you just as easily could send them an email and say hit this website 
um, you know, enter your, uh, uh, you know, enter your credentials and, uh, you know, and register for, uh, for self-service password reset. Uh, you know. um, I know that uh, OWA allows for password reset. Um, TMG uh, does not, UAG, uh, Unified Access Gateway, does have that capability. Neither o, uh, OWA or UAG give you the ability to do it based on shared secrets uh, or based on, uh, you know, an SMS message. So, um, you know, that, that would be the drawback to, to those others. It's like I'm about to get the hook. So, um, we just want to close things off. Um, I am going to be at the Microsoft booth probably for the next uh, two hours following this session. Now, I, I know that there are probably a lot of questions. Um, certainly, I'll take a few now uh, in the 45 seconds that I have left. You have five to, you have five, five minutes. minutes? No. Oh, okay. You got the questions. Seconds. So we have a couple of. How long did it take you to put this demo together, including installation software? Hmm. Um, a typical install of FIM for somebody who knows what they're doing uh, and has received the proper training uh, can take between three and five days. Okay, uh, I've had uh, consultants who know their stuff and are really, really sharp uh, and they can get it done in half a day. Um, and of course that is relying on uh, you know, a heavily scripted install. The, the big thing around FIM is uh, is how much you want to customize it. And, and what I've demonstrated to you today is actually using a lot of out-of-the-box functionality. So the self-service password reset is the easiest component of this to install and configure, and it's there essentially out of the box. You have to come up with the questions that you want uh, your users to answer. Um, the group management capability is there. It's there out of the box. Um, what we did uh, was some customizations around uh, this interface. So we added a logo in, uh, we changed the way that uh, this menu structure was done, we put some filters in for, uh, uh, for different groups of users. So you, you can actually implement a, a, a sandbox system in a, in a fairly short amount of time, if, let's say, if you, if you know what you're doing. Um, but I, I will counsel you that um, and, and any of your colleagues, talk to them about the implementation of their identity management systems, right? They'll probably tell you that it's taken them months uh, to install it and to get it right. Um, it's a complex endeavor, it takes time. It's not actually the technology that slows us down most of the time, it's the business policies, the rules, uh, the, uh, the different groups uh, that are set up uh, and integrating with, with all of the different systems. Um, How important is it to have your AD team to start? Because when you think group management, you need to be in AD for a for a while. Yep. But it's never been cleaned up. There's stuff in there that people might even know where to see. And now yep. we're opening this up. Yep. There's a lot of work. Only us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would hazard a guess that you're not the only person in the room. Yeah, but are. we won't. <laughs> but, <laughs> no one else is brave enough to talk about that. Um, you, you can you can decide what information you want to synchronize uh, from Active Directory or any other directory or any other system. So if there is uh, sensitive information in, in AD, you know there's attributes that you can choose not to to uh, uh, to bring through or or to push out. Um, I'm not going to uh, uh, you know I'm not going to uh, mislead you in any way. Uh, having good data integrity. Uh, in any system that you're connecting into an identity management system is a good practice, right? If you, if you don't address this problem now, um, you know, implementing an identity management system is not going to solve it for you. It might give you a little bit more visibility into it, um, but it's not going to automatically fix it for you. Uh, it's smart. It's not that smart. Um, you know, I've had lots of clients that have sort of gone ahead regardless. Uh, just fully well knowing that they've got some data cleansing uh, that they've got to do along the way. And, you know, you can see how much easier this interface is to work with versus ADUC. Um, you know, you can actually 
get into uh, the user attributes a lot faster and actually you know, get users on board with fixing fixing your own data. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've had a client that's taken that approach. Um, they've almost always had some sort of operational system that they've started with. But you know, if you've got the luxury to do that, go for it. There's two other questions, one at the back and a few up. Oh, I still have to go through all this. Hold this one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> will FIM push identity information to other systems beside AD? Yes. Uh, over 20 different connectors ship with FIM out of the box. Uh, so this could be LDAP servers, it could be other SQL servers, it could be non-Microsoft systems, it could be Oracle databases, uh, it could be uh, just about anything. Um, that require their own username, password, hashes, etc. So synchronizing username and password to connected systems can be a little bit more problematic, but if you know uh, if you know the algorithm that's used for the password hashing, uh, you can do it. So a lot of passwords are hashed either in the old style MD5 or the newer style SHA-1, or if they're really on the ball, it's SHA-256. Um, so if you know that beforehand and uh, you can generate uh, uh, the same algorithm through FIM, then, then you in fact can provision for that. Um, so that was question four. Does the Outlook integration also work with the Mac version? Um, it does not. However, with any uh, SMTP or POP client, uh, you will still get notifications. And so I often get this, this question of, well, does it work with BlackBerry? Well, you can receive the email on BlackBerry. We can send you a URL uh, in, a, in an email message from BlackBerry, and then you can have access to the, uh, to the user self-service portal. Uh, because you can browse the web on a BlackBerry. Uh, and that would be my, my same answer in, in this particular perspective. perspective. We could send uh, the email to, uh, uh, to Outlook on the Mac, they could flip up Safari, and you know, they would be able to uh, uh, do their approval. Uh, what types of actions within FIM can approval processes be put in place for? So I demonstrated it today with um, uh, distribution uh, groups. Uh, it can be used for security groups as well. Uh, I could have put approval in for password reset. Um, so I could have a user you know, uh, enter some information and have a, another uh, approval required. I didn't talk about it today, but um, uh, you should know that uh, FIM is built on something called uh, Windows Workflow Foundation, which allows you to put some very, very complex workflows uh, in place, completely customized to whatever your heart desires or, or needs or business requires, most likely. Um, so it, it's completely customizable, although the, the approvals out of the box are, are actually fairly, fairly sophisticated. I can do escalating approvals. So if, if a user doesn't approve something within a particular time frame, it can bump up to a second level. I can have multiple approvers uh, uh, required for a particular action. Um, so lots of that looks so like- One need, last quick oh. question. Anyone? Quick? No? Okay. So I invite you to visit our sponsors in the University Center. And I hear they you know, have some goodies as well, popcorn and stuff like that. So, head over there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.